This is Monraj and Rosenbaum are humans. I'm Marianne Monraj. I'm here with Benjamin Rosenbaum. And today, Ben is recording from an exciting location in the Swiss Alps. Yes, yes. What I are you in, doing there? I'm in Sasfe, and the, the funny story that I promised is that I'm trapped in paradise. And the reason I'm trapped in paradise <laughs> is, so we're in a lull between coronavirus peaks. Like, like almost nobody has coronavirus now in Basel, but like, it is coming again like r is greater than one like everybody oh, knows is it? like yeah. yeah it's like clear that they've opened up too much and i mean maybe they're gonna lock down more enough in time but now it's you know there's sort of fatigue and right. so people don't like masks and so on so so it's like it's kind of in the, but it's clearly like they did a great job in the beginning so now it's mm-hmm. low but it's coming again so this was like right. now it's time to take a vacation <laughs> yeah <laughs> we went to the alps with masks you have to have masks on public transportation and at least and uh and we got here and everything. And then the plan was to leave and for Noah to go um, to his cousin's house. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just before we were about to leave, I had this little sore throat. And I was like, well, we should probably just let them know, you know, just in case to see if they still want Noah to come or whatever. And then one thing led to another. And pretty soon I was like, oh, I'll just get a test. You know what I mean? I'll just I'll just get a Corona test and just, you sure. know, just put everyone's mind at ease. And then... I got the Corona test and they tell you, they hand you this packet that's like very official. And it's like, now you are in quarantine. You have to stay in quarantine until you get the test results. And it's uh. a little mountain doctor. So we were, we were set to leave on Saturday and on Friday, I go to this little mountain doctor and he's like, well, it's got to make its way down the hill to the hospital right. and whatever. It's like the diagnosis will be ready like Monday or Tuesday. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> so it completely disrupted our whole plan for the beginning of the sure. week but it's also like kind of nice problem to have it's sort of like we're exiled to this amazingly beautiful like mountain <laughs> paradise but now we're stuck here so it's a nice. it's a funny yeah. it's a funny swiss coronavirus story well knock on wood yeah. you're fine no, I mean, and... I, then the throat then the sore throat went away so there's really right. no but we're just mm-hmm. like well we should follow the rules and yes Yes, because you're in Switzerland and people are obedient. And it's also so. funny. It is also a funny way where just there's a symbolic like there like the fact that I took a coronavirus test is actually not data. The fact that I had a sore throat is data, right? right? And then it went away. That's data. The fact that I took the coronavirus test, we don't know anything yet. But when you tell people that you took a coronavirus yet, even also Americans are all like, "Oh, well, you should, you should stay." I mean, you should. Right. <laughs> it suddenly makes it feel much more serious. Like right, right. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No. In fact, I. I I haven't taken one yet and I prob and I should have and I meant to because I went to a protest and they were mm-hmm. asking people if you went to a mm-hmm. protest to go get yeah. tested. Yeah. Um and I meant to and then it slipped my mind and now it's been several weeks since the protest so I'm right. like so now it, now it's exposes. not going to tell them anything about the yeah. protest anymore. So um, yeah. I miss I missed that window and I feel a little bad about that. So All right. Yeah. Back to the subject of the podcast. So today we had a plan that we were going to pick up from where we left off last time, where we had been talking about our early days as baby writers. And today we're going to talk about when we first started publishing short fiction, mm-hmm. right? Yep. yep. Um, this and is chapter two, the Neo Pro. The Neo saga. Pro. And so I'll say my early stuff is um, very atypical, right? Mm. Uh, so I'm going to skim over that because what happened was that I had written these stories. I was sharing them to news groups. I eventually, um, I people would ask me to repost them to the news groups because uh-huh. they would disappear and or they'd be buried very far in. And I got tired of doing that. And a, a friend, this was December in 1995, end of 1995, um, was a computer guy and he said well why don't you put them up on a website and i was like what is a website um Mm -hmm. and he's like i'll build one for you so he showed me he he set it up and then taught me enough raw html that i can maintain it um and so i put up i don't know 20 stories or so on this website and it's then in december of that year um i I realized i wanted to try blogging um it was not called that yet we didn't call it it was called (laughs) online journaling um my there's a thing called the online diary history project and according to it my online journal is currently the third oldest still running journal on the internet so which doesn't get me really much of anything but you know a little (laughs) note in the history books uh useful for an academic grad student at some point looking to like find something to write about um so so um 
but it was great because, um, you know, I had tried to keep journals before in private and failed. Like they all fizzled out. But it turns out I'm a Leo. All I needed was an audience. Mm. And once I had that <laughs> and I allowed comments. So once I had that, I would um, I actually kept it up and I talked about yeah. writing and I talked about my love life and I overshared and um, mm. all of that. It was all a, those things big- the Internet loves. Yeah, yeah, back in the day. And uh, <laughs> and, and then uh, eventually one of the things I was talking about there was, um, you know, I kind of want to have my work in print in a book, um, all of these stories. Maybe I will put together a little self-published collection. And, mm-hmm. um, and one of my readers was Dale Larson, who ran a small press uh, – uh, intangible assets manufacturing. And he contacted me, he said, well, look, I publish computer manuals for the Amiga, um, <laughs> but <laughs> Congress is currently considering the Communications Decency Act mm. because, um, and I had been interviewed about that a couple of times because I was writing about sex and putting my stuff on the internet. Yeah. So um, I'd been in like a TV town hall about it, and the Philadelphia Inquirer interviewed me because I was living in Philly at the time. Um, you were at the vanguard of indecent communications. I was. Well, and, and at that point, and I know this is going to be hard for young people listening to this to understand, but um, Congress really thought they could keep sex off the internet, right? <laughs> and they just had to make a rule. So that was the, the question <laughs> they were they were going to consider very seriously: is could they could they ban sex from the internet? Yeah. Um, and all of us, and and we didn't know, right? It was very early days. So all of us who were writing about sex and very free speechy were kind of like had to face this question of like, would if it became illegal, would we take our websites down? Mm. Would we stop mm-hmm. posting, or would we risk going to jail, right, mm-hmm. to have this up there? So Still and I was, yeah, and I was kind of in the I'm going to jail camp, and I'm going to kick up yeah. a big fuss about it. So, yeah. um, so I think Dale saw all this, and he was like, we should get you into print. And uh, that'll be something of a safeguard. And so he got me and Tracy Lee was a photographer who did um, nude artsy selfies on her blog. And he sort of put our work together in this little print book. Mm -hmm. So that was my first book. I can't remember exactly when it came out. I want to say 97. I would have been 26 years old. I was, I think it came out when I had moved to Oakland and was doing my master's. which is, I have to say, like, sorry, this is a little segue um, into graduate school, but some people here may be interested. Mm-hmm. Um, that was rough. The common writerly path? Well, grad school was great, it, but coming out with a book in mm-hmm. your MFA program hmm. was was really rough. And I have to say, like, wow. I think there was a fair bit of jealousy. Uh-huh. Um which I didn't really understand. Like, I didn't get that was what it was. I was getting a lot of hostility in various forms. Um, surprising, but super ironic. Yeah, I, you know, well, I mean, it's, it's really unusual. I mean, a lot of people who go to MFAs have never published, have never sent anything out, right? Yeah. And so I was, yeah. in some sense, way ahead, but only because, only because I'd done it, not because my writing was necessarily better than theirs. They just hadn't been sending it out, right? And so they... Mm-hmm saw me doing this and like launching a book in my during my MFA program and Mm -hmm. doing readings and so on and um thinking well her my stories are as good as hers how come she gets all the success and it's it can be very poisonous and I think it Mm -hmm. is particularly I I actually think it's worse in lit fiction circles than in science fiction circles and maybe we can talk about why that is at some point um but Anyway, uh, my hypothesis would be partly because it's so tied at the hip to academia. Maybe it might be that it might. I, I guess I don't really know the reason, but I think um, I think part of it is that we don't have convention culture mm-hmm. in literary yeah. fiction. Right. Mm-hmm. So in convention culture, we meet each other all, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of the aspiring writers in America at any rate will meet each other and you have drinks with people, you have meals with people and you think of them as part of your cohort and you cheer each other on. Right. Mm -hmm. So somebody else's success. I mean, it's still hard. Every time there's a a Hugo ballad or a Nebula ballad and I'm like, yep, still haven't finished my book. No chance of being on that. (laughs) Yeah. I'm happy for my friends and miserable for me. Right. So that's that's a little tough. Um, 
but it's still a I don't know. I think in science fiction, you still have a little bit more collegiality, fellow feeling, a kind of sense of like we're we're all trying here, trying to like grow the pie, make a bigger pie instead of fighting for an eighth of the pie. And right? I think it's so. because it's fan first. I think it's because it's yeah. para literature. It's not centered. It's a marginalized literature. And mm-hmm. anybody, you know, it's like people getting into it. I mean, people, at least people connected to convention culture and sort of historical science fiction there's probably some nowadays there are probably people who are just like jk rowling did it i can do it too i'm gonna make a million dollars but like a lot of people come into it first as a fan you know and 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 that's and so you and and spend a lot often spend a long time as a fan before ever becoming pro so they so they identify as fans first i mean you know i I think that's uh i think that's very very common and and so there and there is that i think that does also create this sort of baseline expectation of egalitarian Collegiality. I think my yeah. first wor- world con when I had just got out of Clarion, I remember being like, you know, waiting in a parking lot and after the Hugos and like Neil Gaiman, like walking across the street and somebody in the crowd I was standing in of unknown saying, yelling at him, show us your Hugo. So he, you know, came over and showed us his Hugo. Like, I mean, you know what I mean? Nice. Like, because, yeah. which I don't think works at the Oscars. You know what I mean? I, <laughs> I sort Much of think so. yeah. smaller pond and people smaller think pond, of themselves yeah. are fans first. And so it's, you know, it's yeah. not, you know. Not yeah, some of it is definitely the small pond thing, which I think connects to what I want to talk about with magazines as we go on. Because in science fiction at any, and for people listening, you know, maybe they're com- listening from other genres. But in science fiction, what we have is um, Science Fiction Writers Association puts out um, guidelines on what constitutes a professional publication, a semi-pro or an amateur, which has yeah. have to do traditionally with pay rates and circulation. Yeah. Um, so that is very, very different from literary fiction, which has mm-hmm. no organization saying anything about that yeah. um, and has, you know, you have these big name places like the New Yorker or Atlantic, Harper's, so on. Um, But you have hundreds of what are called the little magazines um, that are often university presses, um, small presses of a variety of kinds, um, and often don't pay anything or they pay in copies. Um, Right. Which is why I say it's joined at the hip to academia, because essentially it's like it would seem like an odd economic activity for so many people to be sending stuff away to be paid in copies, except that many of them are academics and it counts. It counts. It counts like it helps you get academic jobs, right? So yeah. the pay comes in on a on another level. So it's so that's a whole complex structure. Most science fiction writers, um, there are some, but most are not in academic positions, mm-hmm. and so they uh, they're they're looking to the genre for direct commercial income. So uh, okay, I went off on like a random tangent. I got to drag myself back. So <laughs> what I was trying to get to. Um, with the magazines, oh, right, is that in science fiction, there are at any given point, maybe, I want to say five to 15 pro-level magazines, right? There mm-hmm. really aren't very many. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that changes the field as well. And so that's, so when um, when I started writing, um, I was mostly writing erotica. I did write one story. In fact, the first one I published, which was Fleeing Gods, was a fantasy erotica story. It was published by Cecilia Tan at Circlet Press. Paid me money for it. It was awesome. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, uh, and then uh, I, I started going to conventions more as a writer, right? Like I went and I, I would go to the panels that were about writing and it came from the slush pile is a kind of famous panel, which has mostly gone away because it's mean, um, Mm. where editors would read kind of like the worst examples out of uh, their submissions. And at some point someone was like, you know, some of those people might be in the audience and maybe, maybe this is not the best thing to do. Um, But there's also panels talking about characterization and voice and world building and all of this. um, So there's this, a vast educational setup mm-hmm. in science fiction that's very informal, yeah. um, but very effective in a lot of ways. Uh, and so that's that was kind of like, and, and it, I also found a writing community there, I guess, where, yeah. um, you know, we've talked in other episodes about racism in the field, but mm-hmm. I will say, I think I encountered more racism in my MFA program Mm -hmm. than I did in a decade in science fiction. Um, And so 
and I, and you know, not that people in my MFA program, some of them may hear this at some point. It's not that they were awful people, yeah. right? But they were, were, some of them were reflecting kind of attitudes of the time, right? Yeah. Um, things that they'd picked up at various points. And, and I, I, I definitely had some people kind of with the like, well, how could someone like her be successful at this? Right. Uh-huh. right. Um, so that was, that was sure. a little rough. And I, in science fiction, people were actually um, really pretty welcoming. So mm-hmm. I don't know, that was, that's my like <laughs> entry into the field. I started going to conventions. Um, what about you? Where, where did you start publishing? Where did you, when well, did you I start attending? I did this a little, a little bit last bit. time. But uh, picking up where, where I left off, I, I had made my, my, my magic spreadsheet where I was giving myself points and I mm-hmm. was just sending out stories which were crap and then gradually less crap, um, you know, and, and had established, I think most importantly, regardless of whether an individual story was crap or not, like had established a cycle whereby I was rewarding myself for getting rejected yeah. instead of feeling like it was a failure. And I felt like it was a, a tiny, a baby step forward. And, Wait, uh, can I pause for one second? Yeah. I just want to say, having recently talked to two of my for- two of my former students, mm-hmm. um, who don't, it turns out, keep a spreadsheet and don't send things out yet. I mm. I want to emphasize for any new writers reading this, whatever age you are, but if you're new to this, the spreadsheet is super helpful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whether you give yourself points like Ben or not, like I have a tracking sheet. I update it every year. So this year it's Submission Tracker 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, and I put in there, here are the columns. It's the title of the story, um, where I'm sending it to. And I actually will usually like make up a list of 10 places when I started off so that I don't have to think about it every time. Yeah. yeah, Um, yeah. Here's my like little standard list. Then the date I sent it out and the Mm -hmm. date it came back um, and any notes that I have. um, And then if it gets rejected, you just go to the next one on the list and you try and always keep the story out. And I'm not always great about this. Like sometimes it'll come back and a rejection in email and I'll forget to like Mm -hmm. go immediately and update the submission tracker, which is terrible because then it gets buried in my email and six Mm -hmm. months go by and that's six months where that little story could have been hunting a happy home. Right. So, um, so I just want to emphasize that it's really useful to keep that, keep those processes running um, and automate them kind of like as much as you can. So, I mean, I think my big, my just, to broaden that point a bit, I feel like one of my biggest sort of life lessons has Mm -hmm. been, which applies in this and many other things, is like, rather than trying to be, you know, better, like in Mm -hmm. in, in places where I'm lazy or unmotivated or whatever, like some disapprove of myself in whatever way, rather than like, being like this time I will have more willpower, you know, what it's, it's much yeah. kinder and more effective to be like, okay, this is the person that I am with all my strengths and flaws. What will make it predictable? Like yeah. what will, what will make it predictable that even like, even if I'm not a jot less lazy or distractible yeah. or whatever, what will make it predictable that in fact this will happen? And that just in terms of like, also, you know, where you write, when you write, all that kind of stuff. And also like, will you send it out again? Like what makes it predictable? And that, that thing you just said, which is, seems very simple but like just having pre-deciding a list of things to send uh, places to send it out and then not thinking about it when it gets rejected just automatically sending it to the next place if that becomes a routine all of a sudden you don't have to struggle with your own feeling of like good enough did i change my mind blah blah blah. just you know you you know you you, you don't you could skip that whole thing because you already made the list and you could just send it out to the next place and i i do have like a guideline of like I do 10 because if it's been to 10 places and come back, yeah. that's the point at which I'm like, okay, now I have to go and look at the story and see, does this mm-hmm. need revision? Am I still happy with it? It's been yeah. two years. Yeah. I'm a better writer now. Like yeah. maybe I don't want to send this out again or yes, I still have complete confidence yeah. in this. And all of those editors were fools, fools. Yeah. And therefore I'm going to like make my next set of 10 to send it out to. Right. And so it's, and sure. sometimes I retire stories and I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm moving on. I, what you're yep. saying there reminds me of I want to, two things. One is, you know, I'm. This is going to sound like a big tangent, but I'm. <laughs> I'm really interested in how people um, navigate health and fitness and diet and so yep. on. And this is not going to turn into a diet show. But one of the things I was reading <laughs> about was. Um, how do people make lasting changes to the way they eat? And hmm. there was a 
really minor point that struck me is that people who say, I don't want whatever, like I don't want to eat meat today, or I don't want to eat pizza or whatever, have a harder time maintaining it than people who say, I don't do this, right? Mm. Um, by putting it sort of like part of your identity is like, oh, we don't eat meat on Mondays. We practice yeah. meatless Mondays. Yeah. That takes less willpower on yeah, an ongoing basis than, yeah. So, I th mm -hmm. and I thought that was really super interesting. Mm. And it reminded me, have we talked about Ben Franklin and his thing here? I'm a little, we have? It sounds like yeah. it. No, I mean, I, 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 I'm so, I I'm so obsessed it. with this. I bring yeah. it up all the time. But Ben Franklin has a thing in his autobiography. <laughs> anyway, you should go look if you if I haven't I, talked I about it before. We probably, we, I, we, we can put in the show notes the episode when we talk about it, because I'm pretty sure yes, we talked about it. because we did. So, yes. So, habits. Making habits good. Okay. Yeah, going yeah. back to Characters you. Characters formed of habits. And, habits and sending habits. things out. So. Um, yeah. So, I had made my little engine of whatever and started sending things out. And I, I sold a story. Um, I, the check arrived on my 30th birthday. Mm, because nice. as, as we heard in episode one, I, I had taken a long detour of, of renouncing being a writer. Um, but I, uh, yeah, but that was, that was kind of cool. From, F, from the magazine Fantasy and Science Fiction, FNSF. Which is a um, for those who don't know, that's a one of the top pro magazines. They were it used to be they were called the Big Three: um, Asimov's, FNSF, and Analog. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. uh, yeah, exactly. I think I think that has been probably a lot of that. A lot of has shifted, and that's very in flux because of you know online right. things change that a lot. But yeah, in those days, it was it was it was a big deal. I mean, it's still a big deal. <laughs> and they were, and they we were love only, you, Charlie. Were, <laughs> we do, we do. We're very excited. My Asimov's publication was massively important to me. Yeah, so, we love you too. Uh, yeah. Um, so, but uh, but at the time, they, I mean, they were, I guess they were also we, we they were always, only they were only yeah, print. So I just I want to emphasize, yeah, like those were all print mags at well, that point. Yes, and then the second acceptance that I got was from Strange Horizons, uh -huh. which came okay. just later. And in fact. Because online is faster than print, I sold a story to find the science fiction first, but I published in Strange Horizons first. So you must have published very early because we are approaching, Strange Horizons is approaching its 20th anniversary now, which means we yeah. should have launched in 2000, if I'm remembering right. So yeah, this, was, this would have been 2001. Actually, I believe the Strange Horizons stories came out while I was at Clarion. So it was summer 2001. Okay. Um, so which I think, is a so little... The a little like you were saying about going to readings while in your, I mean, to illustrate your point, you know, everyone was yeah. quite delighted, uh, although, yeah. you know, maybe a little uh, uh, struck that I already had stuff out because in Clarion, you're mostly not already published. And I was not published when I went to Clarion, but I became published while I was at Clarion. While you were at Clarion, <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, it's a little, you know, it throws people a little bit. I, I mean, there's so much luck involved in this, yeah. but um, yeah. So try not to take it to heart if people around you are getting published. Oh, you aren't. So. And actually, my, my yeah. Clarion class is instructive in that regard because it was definitely like there were people like me and Kenia Borussalam who had already you know been published, and mm -hmm. um, there were there were people who hadn't. And then we were we we formed a mailing list, which is still going on to this day, of of like mutual support. And there was a lot of um, you know rooting people on and people one by one you know making their first sale and. Uh, it w some of the people who, I, I, if I recall correctly, the the people who hadn't published yet some years on had like made a joking little thing about how they were the zero club or whatever. <laughs> but I want to say like happy ending. I think I think uh, Emily Ma and Susan Yee, some of the people who were like, well, we're the zero club, then became tremendously <laughs> successful. Yeah, like nice. probably outsold all of the rest of us. Like once they went into self publishing and started doing. So getting a real, um, yeah. uh, you know, uh, Kindle uh, kind of marketing savvy and, and, and anyway, so it's very much not a race. Like every, yeah. like there are very different career paths that look extremely different. And so, you know, it's much like, <laughs> it's much like in any, you know, in school when you're sort of thrown together and you're all in fourth grade. And so everyone's comparing all the people in fourth grade to one mm -hmm. another, which is in some sense absurd. And like right. pre, pre compulsory education, no one would have assumed that because you're 10, you like think and learn and have the same skill set as some other 10 year old. Right? right. I mean, but, but, but now everybody's like, well, what's your grade in penmanship? You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and, and th there can be that effect whenever you collect people. So you have this extremely bu diverse bunch of people, but there's this yeah. sense of, of ticking clock. Anyway. Um, so yes, those are my those are my first sales. I was okay. gonna say when we were when we were lauding 
FNSF and Asimov's as well as the newer as the newer places that uh, we we always fail to do self promotion on this podcast. But <laughs> <laughs> I do have things coming out in oh, both. Yeah. Let's oh, see. really? That's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, my Asimov story just came out July twenty twenty. Bereft, mm-hmm. I come to a nameless world, and nice. I had a fantasy and science fiction story again after quite a while where I hadn't been there called, um, which I'm blanking on the name of. What the hell was the name of my story? Rejoice, My Brothers and Sisters, which came out a few months ago in fantasy and science fiction. Nice. Um, anyway, there's another and one there, on Lightspeed. Well, so, so this is a good transition because yeah. Asimov's um, has a p- online compendium, I think, mm. of some kind, digital issues now. Mm-hmm. But at the moment, your story, you got to yeah. buy the print, the print copy to read it, oh, right? Yeah, or the ebook. Or the ebook. Okay, so you, yeah. but you have to. You can't go online and read it for free. It's not on. It's not for free. Well, I have two coming out this month. One at Lightspeed, which is the newer right. model, where it's for free and you just go there and see it. And the other one in fantasy and science fiction, which you can subscribe to in ebook and and print. Right. But it's definitely like a a a uh, purchase market. And it's interesting as a writer considering those two options. Like, on some sense, I really like having things online. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, because I really like them to be immediately accessible and clickable and so on. Mm -hmm. And also for, for just for generally for promotion, for people hearing about it, for people hearing about it in time for award season or whatever, it's like nice for things to be accessible. On the other hand, there's something, first of all, there's something really nice about there being a physical object, which I also rather like. And also there's, it's not the end. It's kind of, I'm perfectly happy to have something initially come out in the format it, something to remember as a writer is you're not selling the rights forever. So if you publish right. something in fantasy and science fiction, it's like, okay, it's only in print or any book. It's not online. But then a few years later, you can reprint it somewhere else. Well, and I think... And then it's online. This is, so this is something where maybe I I disagree with how most people do this, but yeah. I have always, for, for everything I publish in print, um, have asked for and received the right to reprint it on my website yeah. six months later. And... Sometimes in the early days, editors were a little surprised about that, and you would have to like literally go in and like scratch out the line in the contract and initial mm-hmm. it, and mm-hmm. so on. And I think newer writers are often anxious that like if they ask for it, mm-hmm. oh, they're gonna like decide they don't want to publish my story anymore. So that never, I cannot that imagine. That never happens. That never it's happens. Very hard to imagine that they buy your story. You say, "Can I remove this clause?" and they say, "No." And you say, okay, publish it anyway. And then they say, no, because you asked me to remove a clause. That's right. not going to happen. <laughs> it doesn't happen. So like, I, I want to reassure well people, it's always okay to negotiate your contract. You yes. may not get everything that you want, but it's right. not. it won't hurt anything to you ask. Always ask. Uh, and, 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 they, people, yeah, and a lot of times those contracts, particularly if you're publishing with a newer place, like if it's some, mm-hmm. you know, there are many ventures that I've been involved in that somebody started something, they're starting a press, they're starting, a, it's actually very helpful to ask. Like if you're one of the yeah. first people some small press is publishing, by asking them these contracts, you're making their contract better, you're actually helping them. They don't yeah. know that this is bullshit. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, a lot of times they just, particularly if they ask their lawyer, if they ask their right. lawyer who knows nothing about publishing, their lawyer put all kinds of unnecessary restrictions in the contract. Yeah which they really ought to take out. So it is, you're yeah. actually doing them a favor by pushing back. So I'm going to come back to this because I want to talk about how we did the Strange Horizons contracts. But um, let, me, let, me, let me back up a little bit because uh, I want to talk about how we started the magazine. So what, what happened was, you know, so here am I having gone to Clarion in 97, Clarion West, um, little baby writer, first book out, um, finished my MFA, going to conventions. And I went to Worldcon and I, I don't remember which one it was, but I think it must've been around 1999 or so, because um, one of the awards that they give out in the field is the Campbell Award for Best New Writer. And there's traditionally a Campbell Writers panel of the nominees um, for that year at Worldcon, the World Science Fiction Convention. And so I went to it, and one of the Campbell nominees on this panel said he had counted, and in the past year, there had only been 25 pro slots in short fiction hmm. f- that had gone to new writers mm-hmm. in in the various professional magazines. All the other slots, the vast majority of the slots, had been taken up by established writers. And that's not surprising when you think about the fact that print magazines are... Um, generally, were dependent on newsstand sales back then um, as a big part of their income, and they needed to put 
names on the covers to attract people to buy them. So I mean, just as a footnote, I feel like they were still in the habit of putting names, but in fact, by 1999, newsstand sales had collapsed. That you could not find an Asimov's on a newsstand in 1999. In 1980, yeah, but like they were stuck in an old model in a way. Right. So that's and it's yeah. I would I would believe that I'd have to go and look. Um, and Judd, I think, did a lot of research on this at yeah. one point, and we sh- he can come and talk no, about I could, it. I could be more. wrong, but I remember yeah, at the time yeah. sort of feeling like it was all. No, 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 no. I think I think that's totally plausible. So, in any case, they felt like they needed to put names on the cover. They also felt like, I mean, there's sort of funny things. I remember Shauna McCarthy, who was editing FNSF back then, I want to say, um, talked on a panel about how I she. Think so. I think Gordon was editing FNSF. I think she was editing either fantasy anyway go on i can't remember whatever she was editing yeah. it was something realms that was of fantasy. fantasy realms, realms of fantasy? fantasy no i, I don't know like whatever it was she said that every she tried to buy stories with dragons in them because every time That's she put a dragon, dragon on, the on the cover it bumped up her newsstand sales by 50 percent. so <laughs> um yeah. so these are the things that go into <laughs> some of these decisions but uh to me, I, I heard this guy talking and I said, well, that explains why I'm having a hard time publishing my stories. But also it seemed like an like a artificial bottleneck in the field, right? And I, I, I think they also, we're, we're talking about newsstands and the effect on newsstands, but to some extent, there's a similar thing online, which is that if you publish a story by somebody, by Neil Gaiman, he's got a huge Twitter following. Him tweeting out the link to the story sure. is more effective than the new writer. The, the sort of same kind of power dynamic exists online. Right, too. but... But I will I will argue that um, online frees you up in certain ways. So uh, yeah. so what happened is so I was like okay we really could use more pro magazines in the field right, mm-hmm. and I was talking to friends. Starting a pro magazine is expensive, print costs. If you're paying your editors, blah blah blah, that's a lot of money, right? We did not have that yeah. much money lying around to to invest in this. Um, but we were children of the digital age. And so we were like, well, we could just try doing an online magazine. And there had been a few. Um, at that point, I think there were two others going. Um, Sci Fiction, which was uh, edited by Ellen Datlow and funded with TV money from the Sci-Fi mm-hmm. Channel. And, mm-hmm. um, and Infinite Matrix, which was edited by Eileen Gunn, if I'm remembering mm-hmm. right. I think, um, that, I think that Ellen Datlow had also come from Omni. Like Omni right, magazine so was, had an online science fiction publishing thing very, right. very early. And then, right. then it so, so I was going to say, early. I was going to go back and say that. But yes, at, yeah. the, at the time we started, there were only two running at that mm-hmm. point, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, so I... I said we could we could do one. What would be involved if we don't pay the editors? If we're going to come out weekly so that we can build readership and um, and we we ended up setting a budget of ten thousand dollars and the uh, to cover web hosting costs, but mostly to pay writers. The vast majority of the money was going to go yep. directly to paying writers. All the editors were volunteers. All the st- staff were volunteers. So I'll say at this point, I faced incredible hostility um, Mm -hmm. and anger from a lot of professionals in the field about Mm -hmm. this. Um, People were, um, they would say, you know, these online magazines are going to be the death of short fiction. They're going to destroy the print magazines. You're undercutting us um, by not charging because we were going to make it free to the public. Um, You're, not paying your editors that, you know, essentially these are like scabs that are undercutting the work of paid people. Mm -hmm. And in retrospect, I kind of think they were right in a lot of that. About the, yeah. I mean, there's two arguments there and I think maybe they were right about one of them. I didn't see it at the time and I didn't, I also didn't care. I was a writer primarily. And so I was Mm -hmm. focused on like, and there was, there's sort of like the shtick in the field of like money flows to the writer. And it's Uh so important that writers get paid. And there was very little conversation about it being important that editors get paid. Right. And so. Because writers tend to write all the things that. (laughs) Well, editors are a little behind the scenes and people aren't paying attention to whether the copy editor is getting paid or whatever. Right. It's just not as visible. And also so, traditionally, like particularly in book publishing, the power ha- power differential has been the other way. Like the editors have been associated with right. the companies that have the money and the capital. And right. So I, you know, 
so the people who, and not everyone was hostile, but some people were, you know, sort of like, they wanted to cheer me on, but they were really worried about what the consequences were going to be, right? And I, I feel like Sheila Williams is the current editor of Asimov's, I think, like, I remember some early conversations with her, where she was always personally encouraging to me, mm-hmm. um, and supportive of Strange Horizons mm-hmm. in, in that sort of way, but... Um, was worried. And I, I, I was on panels, I would in those early days, I would be once we launched the magazine, we got together 30 volunteers, we put this together. It was very chaotic. My webmaster quit like two days before launch and I had to stay up all night, like learning Mm -hmm. enough HTML to put the magazine up because I was determined that we were going to like be professional. Mm -hmm. And if we say we're launching on this Monday, we're launching on this Monday, whatever. Um, because there were so many people who were not taking online publications seriously at that Mm -hmm. point. And it was a huge argument in the field about whether online publishing counts. Right. And literally SIFWA, I think was still deciding whether, um, whether it would count as a pro sale. You you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't measure circulation in the same way for one thing. Right. So you can measure pay rates. And so we were like, well, we can measure pay rates and we have a hit counter on our site. We can tell you how many people stop at the page. Um, We don't know how many of them actually read to the end of a story. And how many are humans. Well, back then, I think they were human, right? This is 20 years ago. Google's already spidering, so. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. okay. So, I I mean, I I was also working in the internet in those days. I remember how how complex that number was. I remember following this debate, and it was like, I I mean, some people were just, I mean, I think to some extent it was just curmudgeonliness and and fear of change. And to some extent, it really was a a very different world and a hard problem for SIFWA to decide what counts as enough circulation. You know, what does that mean even? Um, Yeah. And, and, uh, and I mean, the other thing that's important in terms of the context, we were talking about newsstands, you know, it wasn't really, I don't know that the online magazines had that much effect on the print magazines. What was having an enormous print effect on the print magazines and creating a lot of this fear was the fact that distribution and consolidation of publishing and everything had completely like there, th- this was a context where in that year that you're launching Strange Horizons, there had been an exponential cratering of their subscriptions from like, right hundreds of thousands back in the 70s and 80s down to like or more million i mean they had enormous they had much bigger circulation mm. and they had dwindled to you know to barely getting by bare bones and i think if you look at those numbers um and and if anything i mean you know it's not like the online magazines killed them if anything i think they may have recovered a little bit but you know it, it just was a new world where there was a right. lot of um i mean it's comparable to the way that you know network tv shows of the back in the only three networks right. You know, they had these vast numbers that nobody today, the, the biggest hit show, right. you know, does not compete with just a boring show from, you know, a, the biggest hit show does not have more number, more sort of viewers, viewership probably than like Three's Company, you know? Yeah. I I don't know the details, but that sounds yeah, plausible I'm, to I'm, me. I'm, yes. I'm talking out of my ass, but. <laughs> well, because, because I, I, I wonder, because. On the one hand, yes, there's been this prol- proliferation of markets and media and you know now there are a thousand magazines instead of five you know yeah. fine like that on the other hand at the same time we are reaching all of these people that we couldn't have reached before right sure. so strange sure. horizons is read around the world in a way that asimov's wouldn't have made sure. it there right it would not make it to sri lanka to be on newsstands right or very you mm-hmm. know one newsstand in one bookstore in mm-hmm. the country, right? Sure, that kind of sure. thing, right? Yeah, no, that's at, definitely at true. And, so, and, and, I'm, and I don't, and I'm, I, I, maybe I was unclear, but I'm not making the argument that the proliferation yeah. of venues was really what, what right. affected it. It, it. It's, I don't think that the fact that there were more little magazines had very much effect because the big effect that totally swamps that is simply yeah. that their, their distribution system collapsed. You know? And that collapsed because the big German media conglomerates were buying up a lot that, of the smaller yeah, publishing I mean, houses, I to, think. To I, mean, really, I don't remember the details specifically. I mean, to so. really understand it, I think we'd have to get somebody on as a guest who's, who's more who, of a... Who knows this stuff. But All there right. was yeah. a massive consolidation. I mean, yeah. I, you know, multi, Bertelsmann is a good example, but Viacom, whatever. Multinationals all over. What happened was, I think, partly, I mean, my guess, and again, this is me talking about my ass, but that my guess is that it had a lot to do with 
increasing sophistication of supply chain management. You know, it used to be yeah. hard to have a business that sold toothbrushes and a business that sold books under the same ownership because they were different and they did things differently. And as things got more computerized and consolidated, you could just see books as widgets. And so a lot of the publishing, you know, a lot of things got vertically monopolized. I mean, and this is also in the context in general of yeah. uh, hyper consolidation and like it's related to income inequality, like a few wealthy people owning a much bigger share of America in and and the and the world probably um certainly the industrialized world in like 2020 than they did in 1970 right and so yeah. a, you know, a lot of that that had already hit the these these industries and so a lot of places that had been independent became part of these big consolidated things and i think also distrib distrib distribution wise i think also yeah. newsstands were not doing their buying independently they were getting their shipments in a big container and that's what they sold and it was you know asimov's wasn't in there you know yeah um and so, uh, yeah, but, but, and, and that, that gradually enormously weighed on their circulations because they didn't really have the, uh, there wasn't the way to find new buyers because people weren't mm -hmm. stumbling upon, there was a constant stream of people stumbling upon the magazines and newsstands. They had to already know about it and be a, a fan to have a subscription. If anything, you know, you could make the argument that now, 20 years later, that it, the online magazines helped save the print magazines because- yeah. How were people going to discover the print magazines? They were not. So the most likely reason that people are, you know, finding the print magazines is because they're finding the online magazines through the world of links and free right. stuff, and then becoming interested in those authors and deciding to pony up for a right. print copy or a, or an ebook. So you know that I think it it as many times when something new comes into the ecosystem, especially an ecosystem under stress. There's this fear that it's going to contribute to the collapse, but in fact, it ends up in a new equilibrium. You know, so. So, oh, yeah, <laughs> it's so it's interesting, like, it's very hard to trace the pattern of everything that happened. I, I will tell one anecdote, right, right, that to me is sort of significant. So we started the magazine, we launched in September 2000. Um, we're really almost at our anniversary, we're going to have a huge party at Worldcon, mm -hmm. we had this plan and uh, in New Zealand to celebrate our 20th anniversary. And that is, unfortunately, not happening, maybe the 25th, we'll do something fabulous. Yeah. Um, when we're out of pandemic land knock on wood. Um, so the, uh, what was I going to say? The, we started the magazine, we had our growing pains, et cetera, so on, but we, we published weekly, we paid pro rates, um, after some time, and Jed could, would know this better than me, but eventually Sifwa agreed that we qualified as a pro magazine and they made it retroactive so everyone who had been published in the magazine could count those sales for, um, you need three pro level sales to become a member of Sifwa to become considered a professional science fiction writer. And that's a whole conversation in and of itself, which we'll put to the side. Um, yeah, of course. But, yeah. but it, it was something that mattered a lot to young writers at the time, I will say. Like it was I becoming mean, a member of CIFWA was huge back I mean, then, I, right? I think that's actually a really fascinating thing, just a, a slight digression, mm -hmm. but we've, we've touched on this before. It's, I feel like it's compared to literary, especially with comparisons to literary fiction and other forms, like it's fascinating that CIFWA, simply by this very tiny lever of power that they have, which is you <laughs> You can join our club and be recognized as a professional writer, you know, if you if you have sold to these publications and here's a list of the publications. That lever has actually, I think, really um, had a, an, an almost, you know, it's not a union, but it's had mm -hmm. an effect on keeping yeah. writers paid in this corner of the world, in this genre, because yep. it does set this benchmark, which which publications aspire to. You know, there's something called pro rates and 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 yeah. and publishers aspire to pay those rates and try to wrestle enough money together to, to pay those rates and that just that little bit of yeah. of mind no, share every, of every, being able yeah. to pay what pro rates is has allowed Sifwa to have this sort of basically outsized effect in the market given how yeah. little actual power they have you know yeah no every time Sifwa raised their rates we would have this big conversation at Stranger yep. Islands of like are we gonna try and raise enough money to match that and keep our pro status yes we are okay we're gonna yep. like have to hustle on the fund drive because um so when we set it up with our ten thousand dollars we had some donors at the beginning who were donating the initial year's funds but our plan was that we would 
uh, do crowdfunding. It wasn't called that back then, but we try to raise money from the community. Um, and we'd like add a thousand dollars every year. So that, in t- so raise a thousand, two thousand, three thousand. So, and some years we raised more than that, which was great because it eased the burden on the individual donors. But, um, I want, I want to sort of be transparent about like what it took to get strange residents off the ground was some individuals putting in a big chunk mm-hmm. of money up front. I don't think that is necessary now because crowdfunding has become much mm-hmm. more effective. But back then, um, like it, it would have been difficult. And we were fighting this, you know, again, like writers were reluctant to submit to us because mm-hmm. they didn't know whether we would be um, credited for SIFWA and they didn't know whether it would feel like a real publication. And that's, yeah. that's one thing I really wanted to get to in this episode is, And I think some of this still lingers. There is still a weight to print. Mm -hmm. Um, But I used, I mean, I had all these early conversations with people who were like, well, why don't you do print? Why don't you do print? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, no one's going to take this seriously. No one, no big name writers will submit to you. And we're like, well, we don't, we are a nonprofit. We set ourselves up as a nonprofit. We have a budget that we can manage. We don't have to try and get huge. So we don't have any pressure that we need to like solicit Neil Gaiman to send us a story or anything Mm -hmm. like that. We can pay everyone the same rate, which Stranger Horizons has always done, which is not typical. Like lots of the print mags will have like an advertised, this is outside the field. I I don't know for everywhere, but I know like Virginia Quarterly, for example, is someplace I've submitted fiction where they have a published um, Mm. rate for over the transom submissions, but they have a separate pool for solicited money, right? Mm-hmm. Solicited material and a lot of them that are is completely opaque about what they pay. I mean, I was yeah. always I mean, I've yeah. sold to McSweeney's and I got paid different things different times and there's yeah. no nothing listed and it's unclear, right. you know. And it, it I mean, it's really variable. It could be anywhere from like their published rate is like 200 a story and they actually will pay 5,000 to huh. Alice Monroe, right? Yeah. Like that's yeah. how much sure. of a differential there is. So, um so we weren't doing any of that and we didn't, we didn't need to maintain that. And so, uh, but, but we, but to we be fair, really... I think most of the science fiction print magazines don't like not, it's not that scale. It might be like seven to 10 words, seven to 10 cents a word, but it's not an order of magnitude. I don't think. I have no idea. I don't yeah. know what their okay. budgets look like. I'd, I'd have to like, ask Sheila um, yeah. and ask Charlie, like, do you have a separate fund for, right. you know, when George R. R. Martin sends you a story? Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so, so the, anyway, the, what I was trying to get to was that we had this reputation problem, mm-hmm. right? And part of building the reputation was simply being consistent and coming out on time and publishing good work, having people talk about the work, et cetera. But it, it did feel a little chicken and egg in the early days mm-hmm. of like, mm-hmm. well, sure. how can we publish good work if the writers won't submit to us because yeah. we don't have a good enough reputation that yeah. they're willing to risk their stories with us, right? And so the the anecdote I wanted to get to is there was a point where I was at a convention. I want to say this is one or two years in where I was in the audience and it was, they had editors up on the panel. And so there are five editors of magazines, all print magazines. I don't remember offhand who they were. Um, And I was feeling perhaps a little bit like, hey, you know, like maybe you could have one online magazine up there. And so when it got to the Q&A portion uh, from the audience, I stood up and said, um, and this is the room held I want to say like 300 people and it was full. Many yeah. aspiring writers had come to this yeah. panel, right? So I stood up and I was like, hey, I'm Marianne Monraj. I'm editor in chief of Strange Horizons. And there was this roar of applause. I mean, just <laughs> the whole room broke out into like wild yeah. applause. And, you know, yeah. I only ran the magazine for two years. So it must have been in, during yeah. that t- two year period. Yeah. Um, really. But it was this this kind of like moment of like, There is a tension between the online Mm -hmm. magazines and the print magazines, Mm -hmm. and it is being demonstrated in this Mm -hmm. moment, right? Um, Also, and also because I mean, precisely the handicaps you your 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 talk or the (laughs) barriers you're talking about, where it's like, well, we can't get the big names to submit to us. But you know, you you made a virtue of that because new new, strange writers became known as a welcoming place for new writers, which is probably why a lot of the aspiring writers in the room are cheering, is because strange writers is kind of a champion of 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 
aspiring writers. Well, and that was the goal, right? The goal was, I mean, that was why we started in the first place. And we published 51 stories a year. We took a week off for the winter holidays. Um, and I think in those years, we published, in the, certainly in those first years, we published more new writers than anyone, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would, I would argue that Strange Horizons really transformed the shape of the field in those early days. And then other magazines showed up. Um, and some of and them I have say a, 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 a solution to the problem of we don't, we can't get like famous and important writers to submit to us is to publish new writers and grow them into famous and important writers, which, you know, yes. arguably you did. So we did, although, you know, writer, often they yeah. would, you know, like I would say like what happened at, and I think, I suspect this still happens is they publish with us. Maybe their first mm -hmm. stories was sure. with us, second story. And then as they become better and more confident, they, they start. Yeah, they're like they go to Asimov's, Clark's World, Lightspeed, but I I do think Clark's World and Lightspeed are online magazines, right? And so uh, a major thing that changed, um, and Abyss and Apex and Podcastle and uh, Escape Pod, that whole grouping, mm -hmm. etc. A major thing that changed in these twenty years is uh, we won the reputability fight, right? Yeah. Like it's no longer a question yeah. whether online magazines. Uh, are worth publishing in. They clearly right. are, and it's a. I mean, and, and you know, I, I I think it's it's reasonably clear in terms of both prestige and man cents per word. You know, right. the Tor.com, dot com, which is an online magazine, is like you know that's the that's the best paying and sort of why you know widest. Right. And and if you're a writer listening to this and you're like, well, how do you know reputation? You know, there's you can participate in writer communities and so on, but one way is to look at the nominees for awards. So if you yeah. look at who, who in the short story novelette, novella categories for the Nebulas and the Hugos and um, those two in particular, I think over yeah. the last 10 years and just make a list of all the places that people got published from, that'll give you a, a good I approximation. Do yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's a good spreadsheet to have. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm like, you have the spreadsheet. Would you make it public? Can we put it on the SLF site? Is it a All general right. resource? All right. I so mean, we'll, I, I, you, you might want to go over the data again, and it's not, you know, I mean, some, someone can we'll put your, it, We'll put your name on it. They can come yell at you. But, you know, yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, Darius, this, I'm speaking to our showrunner here. Make a note, like, we should add this as a resource to the SLF site. But, uh Although I will so, say I feel a certain ambivalence because it's like, I don't know. I mean, there is a downside of that, of course, which if it becomes too well-known, which is that, I mean, it's great for writers in the moment, but it also sort of entrenches the hierarchy. It's like somebody got a couple lucky hits, you know. You're, yeah, you're, you know, may, it does. But on the other hand, them. if writers are doing this on their own, which sure. I was, sure, right, sure. like it evens the playing field at least to like, yeah. you know, for yeah, people yeah. who don't have the time or the resources to do that research themselves, sure. right? Sure. So, um, and yeah, I mean, you yeah. can always be quixotic about it and be like, I'm not going to submit to any of the top markets. So there. Sure. Um, well, I wanna... And I think, again, that it's like, it's like that's that's a, first of all, the past is not a predictor of the future. Like there was, right. you know, like like some magazine that hasn't won any awards yet. If your story is there and it's award winning, it might win awards now, you know? Right. I mean, and, yeah. and also like, it matters where you want to be, you know? Yeah. It matters what, and there, and there is a personal waiting, like, you know, yeah. like, what awards do you care about? Like, you know what I mean? Like, for me, the tip yeah. tree is like, as it, or I'm sorry, the otherwise award is yes. as, uh, is, you know, is, 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 uh, desirable. as central, <laughs> as important yeah. to the field. Yeah, as desirable. You know, like, it, it, it what, what do you, how do you see, you know, and, and it, a lot of it has to do with what communities do you want to be a part of? I mean, particularly in the early days when I was publishing a lot in Straight Horizons and my editors, the editors were friends, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. first they published and then they became friends, not the other way around. But, you know, it's like it was it was like being welcomed to a community. And actually, yeah. it was very easy to become friends with the editors of Strange Horizons because back in those days, um, I think the three of them operated as a hive mind, but you always had one. At, I mean, this, I'm talking about the era when Jed, uh, Karen and Susan were editing. And, yeah. and you, they operated as a hive mind and consulted each other, but you always had one that essentially you were assigned to who was your point person is my understanding. Right. Yep. <laughs> so I got no, that, right. which meant I was having extremely long email conversations because Jed and I will write like three paragraphs about one semicolon, whether, you know, right. having the best time, like the best time deciding whether the semicolon yeah, goes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, at some point it'd be worth publishing, I don't know, like the email exchange if, with Jed's permission really? on like <laughs> us behind your sky or something, because it's just like epically long uh that's email. fascinating yeah. you should publish it that sounds cool so yeah, yeah so uh, 
anyway, I guess where I'm taking this is like, if you are listening to this and you're like, I totally want to start a magazine, then I would say, yes, do that. And, and I, I, I have to, again, give credit to Gavin Grant because um, of, uh, of Small Beer Press. He, I think at that same convention where there was the Campbell panel, I attended a panel that he was on where he was talking about small presses and he said, let a thousand flowers bloom. Right. Mm-hmm. And that is yeah. definitely, I think, uh, influenced this, the creation of strange horizons. Um, so if you're thinking of doing that, if you are, maybe it's, um, for your country, for your region, for a underrepresented group that you feel is having a hard time breaking into the big known magazines, um, whatever, or maybe it's subject matter. You're like, I want more sword and sorcery with dragons. You know, dragons are the best. I do think dragons are the best. So like whatever it is, um, these are sort of like some of the things to think about. Uh, how do you make your magazine a place that writers want to submit to? And, you know, money is one thing and it's an important thing. Um, if you can pay your editors, I would say do that. And in retrospect, I think that's, I wish before I left the magazine, I ran it for two years and then I handed it off to Susan Groppy, who had been a fiction editor. Um, I wish before I handed it off, I had had a, a conversation with her about working towards paying staff mm-hmm. um, and making that part of the priorities, even if that meant publishing fewer stories. Um, and that would have been a tough choice and it, she may not have decided to go that way, who knows. But these days I, I kind of think labor should be compensated. And um, and the editing labor that Jed put in, yeah. I think was huge, yeah. huge in terms of establishing our reputation in those early days. Those exchanges oh, oh, with writers. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Well, I'm thinking about what you're talking about. I've seen, talking some about. Of, yeah. I've seen some of Jed's exchanges <laughs> on this kind of thing. And so I know he puts in a, he put in a tremendous amount of time. And so, and, I and mean, effort that and thought. also that amount of relationship forging. And I know other people who, like, Jed was my editor, quote unquote, because I think they were all yeah. behind it. And I was very close to Susan and Karen too, but, but you know, we got to, you got to sign an editor, but I know other people who had been, who, you know, saw Susan as the, as the face of, right. of Stranger Eyes and the Karen. But all of them, I think there was this, and also this sort of epic tea party, you had tea parties at every con where you would stand on a right. chair or Susan would later stand on a chair and, you know, welcome everybody. And there was, you know, it was, it, it you did a tremendous job of forging community. And, and that was one of the, I mean, you know, even beyond just, giving a lot of slots to new writers and paying pro rates. Mm-hmm. I think that there was, that this, this, uh, you know, the, the creation of community was also really one yeah. of the legacies, you know? Well, and I want to, I want to pause and talk about the tea party in particular there. I think that's a really, that's worked out really well <laughs> for the magazine. Before, this was before tea party meant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for those the reason, of you... So for those that don't go to conventions, though, like um, sci-fi conventions have traditionally had evening room parties, right? And uh, the room parties would often have alcohol provided. Um, The magazines, the bigger magazines might host parties. People host book launch parties. There are bid parties for uh, groups that are like, we want to throw the next Worldcon, et cetera, so on, right? Um, And so like official programming often slows down or stops in the evening and people go to the parties and, or they go and hang out in the bar traditionally. And I think science fiction in the sixties, seventies, eighties was more of a heavy drinking culture than it is now. Mm -hmm. So nineties even, but when we get to Stranger Horizons launching in 2000, I mean, first of all, I drink alcohol, but I'm not much of a drinker. Mm -hmm. Jed doesn't drink. Um, and also, like, the evening slots were pretty full, right? And yeah, so, contested. And, and I am from Sri Lanka. I grew up drinking tea with milk and sugar. I'm enough of an Anglophile mm-hmm. that I have mm-hmm. a soft spot for the, the sort of British afternoon tea with the little sandwiches and the cookies and all of that, little cakes and so on. And so I was like, this would be fun. And it would let us have our party at a time slot where we're not competing with other people. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't have to provide alcohol, which is going to save on the party costs tremendously. Right. Right. We can really, and I, you know, my and most recent book is... Well, and I, I didn't 
I don't know that we knew that in advance. Like, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. sort of like, this was my thinking at the time. I love feeding people too, right? Like, my mm-hmm. most recent book is a Feast of Serendip is a Sri Lankan cookbook. And um, if I was going to host a party, there had to be good food, right? Mm-hmm. So those early parties, and I, I think they've gotten away with this a little bit, away from this a little bit, since I'm not there to like obsessively make tea sandwiches. <laughs> huge but, uh, Tupperwares full of. I, that's um, what I would do, right? Like I would, I would, I would make like egg salad. I would bring the cucumber. I buy cucumbers, and like I'd have a couple hours of cooking before the party, right? I'd make cookies in advance and so on. So we would put out a spread and. Um, and it's interesting because I think often the evening spreads at the parties uh, would be mostly sugary stuff or chips. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we'd put out a veggie tray, we'd put out a fruit tray. And, and all so, kinds of Sri Lankan and, delicacies and things. I well, mean. eventually, yeah. yeah. So, and, and the cookies were there, but I think there's something very healthy and wholesome about the Sri Lankan, about this, about the Strange Horizons tea parties. Yeah, yeah. Um, and a, a culture of where we want to tell you about the magazine. We, I really did have a sense of, and this is a little weird. Like I get a little proprietary as Ben knows. Um, <laughs> and I definitely had this like little sense of like, these are my writers in mm-hmm. the first couple of years. Right. And like, these are my little baby chicks. We've published them. I'm super proud of them. Um, these days, I, I'm very much in an auntie mode to many yeah. young writers uh, in Sri Lanka and elsewhere. But I think I had that same mentality then. Like, yeah. I want to gather them together, introduce them to each other. I'm a compulsive introducer. Like, I was going to say, it was almost a, a, a matchmaking Yenta yeah. aspect. You're like, you're, you're, you're my writers and you're going to know each other and like each yeah. other now. We're yes. locking the doors. <laughs> I can't force you to like each other, but I'm going to make you talk to each other. And, yeah. and, but, I, but I also like, you know, I think so many of us who come to science fiction fantasy come out of, uh, and maybe this is less true for youngsters now, but back in the day, we were geeks. We were maybe excluded from the popular kids in our communities. So I certainly came to the field with an absolute horror of excluding anyone, mm. which Mm-hmm. can cause its own problems, yeah, right? Yeah. Which CF, uh, geek social fallacies. Geek social fallacies, which yeah. I recommend people look up if they're not familiar with. <laughs> also, but, but the the positive side of it is that um, how that manifested at the Strange Horizons tea parties was that we did, I think, together, and it, it's not just me, right? Like it's Jed and Susan and Karen did all this work and our articles editors and our reviews mm-hmm. editors and our poetry editors um, and our art editors, we had this staff of 30 volunteers, which yeah. also they weren't always at every convention, but yeah. we usually had five to seven of them at the con. Mm-hmm. So we had these kind of like built in party hosts as well, who mm-hmm. were all, all doing this work of introducing the writers yeah. to each other and the poets and the fiction writers and um, and building this very lovely thing at the tea parties. And now I think there's been a recently there's been this conversation about like sober sobriety in Mm. socializing at conventions Mm. and elsewhere Mm -hmm. and um, people talking about alternatives to the evening drinking and whatever else. And I think that um, we didn't set our tea party up to be a sober space. Like that wasn't the intent, but it, it worked out great. And I think it kind of shows that you don't need alcohol to um, build community, right, yeah. and to to make friendships, and you know we're we're at an advantage in science fiction fantasy because we are fans and we love the stuff. Mm-hmm. And so if you come yeah. in and you're like, "Did you see the latest Picard episode?" Like, mm-hmm. boom, you've got five people in the room who are like immediately going to engage in that conversation, mm-hmm. right? Or, well, that's interesting too because it is yeah. there is so much science fiction fantasy now that I feel like that phenomenon is a little. I mean. You know, it, it, yeah. it, it's much more fractured because I haven't seen the latest Picard. Have you seen the latest? Of course. <laughs> Shira? No, no. Well, I mean, have you seen no, the latest? Shira? Shira. But my point is that, no, like, no, right, my you've daughter seen is the latest Picard, Shira, but I'm not but, caught up. You know, up, it's, but... it's, 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 it, my point is that it is interesting yes. how the, the, the science fiction, there is this interesting thing where you and I are of a generation when science fiction was like a misfit outsider thing. And now that science mm-hmm. fiction has conquered the world so profoundly, one of the yeah. things that happens is this fracturing where it's like, I don't know that I can necessarily walk into a a, a convention and we are, I mean, like if I pick my panel carefully, but like a random convention room, like, will I have seen the same properties yeah. as them? Probably, maybe not. I don't know. You know, yeah. so, um, but uh, 
Yeah, I was gonna say um, we should we should we should be mindful We're of time. We're gonna have to wrap soon because we have, you wanna, where you we have a hard stop in ten minutes. I have, I have one more thing I want to say. Yeah, okay. so say your thing, and you, I'll say my thing. Um, well, two. I mean, I, uh, there's a couple things that occurred to me about um, strange traditions. Okay, so one of the things is I wanted to generalize, uh, just sort of pop up and talk about the, the more gener- generalized lesson. Since 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 you've taken this in the direction of like advice to like oh, so yeah. you want to found a, a thing, um, and I think the the, the as an outside observer, uh, one thing that I notice is that the, the you doing there is like harnessing like all of who you are. You know what I mean? Like it's not mm. obvious that being that loving making cucumber tea sandwiches is an asset for starting a magazine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or being no, a magazine. Think, I, but you man but you know what I mean? But you but but yeah. but but like you brought your whole self to it. And that's interesting. And mm. I think like many successful things have that aspect of like whatever yeah. your skills are, they are they you yeah. know, that you the more you can weave together. And, and um, so that, so three things, that's one thing. Another thing is, and the, a little provocatively, like I agree with you about the w- importance of paying people for their work and the fact that there was a, I mean, I think those people, uh, early naysayers about strange horizons were sort of wrong on two counts and right on one count. You know, mm-hmm. they were, as you said, they, 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 they strange horizons sort of won the respectability or the like, is this, is this worthy? Like, you like, yes, it's, Yes, it's great. And two, sustainability, which is, you didn't talk about much, but I think that was people's, yeah. a lot of people's concern was like, how yeah. can you possibly, coming from a like, this is a product, we sell it, you're not selling it? Like, this is a scam. Right. I mean, right. and I think it was, it, it, and it, what crowdfunding wasn't an obvious thing in those days. And I remember being, it being talked about, like the way, when I, when it clicked for me, is I was like, well, how you, it was like, it's the museum model, which basically is right. what it is. I mean, in, in yeah. down to also like not crowd, trying to crowdfund, but having a few wealthy donors as a backstop is like, right. that's how museums work. Right. So, right. so, um, you know, it was a museum, like a mm-hmm. living science fiction publishing all the time. And I'll, and I'll say, like, I use that phrase a lot and I would agree that that, that helped frame it for people. The yeah. other thing that I would bring up was Ms. Magazine because mm-hmm. uh, Ms. Magazine stopped taking advertising mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. at a certain point yeah. because yeah. they felt it was compromising their editorial yep. work. Yep. And there was a lot of concern that they would fold as a result. Yeah. And they did not. Their subscribers said, no, we believe in yeah. what you're doing and we want you to keep doing it. So yeah. I think yeah. that, that influenced but again, that was more, but then, then. You know, but, but the su- subscribers were then paying, right? I mean, per... They were. They, per they were although right, they were also so. fundraisers and things. Anyway, anyway, so back was, in, the, like in the early days in the internet, a lot of magazines yeah, yeah. were looking to advertising to support yeah, themselves. Yeah, and yeah, this yeah. is why we didn't. Like, right, right, so. right. So anyway, the the um, there's that... So there were, the, you know, on those counts, sustainably, they were wrong. Arguably on the issue of being scabs and like, you know, de- defunding right. the editorial profession, they were, they were right as you say, but I do also have a, a sort of ambivalence about that because not because I don't think everybody should get paid because they should, but because that army of 30 volunteers sure. where, which, which, which was automatically itself a community and meant that that, that party was full of people right. already participating in San Tries and that the bar to participating at, you know, if you came to that party and you wanted to be part of the staff of Strange Horizons, the answer was sure. Right. Which you know, once as soon as you're paying people, either you have a two tiered system where it's like, why are the why are you exploiting your interns when you're right. paying your staff, or you have like, sorry, you know, send a job application. Like, there's only money for three of us. So this and, is you know, probably like uh, we should we should have this as a longer different, conversation. A conversation. No, 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 conversation. no, 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 no. Like, I want us to get into this because like yeah. we're we're in the midst of figuring this out for the SLF as well, right? Yeah. And we're you know, I think I would say is like where we are now is. They're, we're paying hourly for certain things, yeah. like mm-hmm. our even for this podcast, we're paying Darius to yeah. do our video editing. Yeah. Ben and I are not getting paid, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, yeah. the talent is not getting paid, and the staff is, right? And yeah. so, there's well, we're promoting um, our we're supposed right, to be and, promoting our stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're we're you know at the yeah. SLF, we're paying now. We're paying a bookkeeper, and we're paying a um, it's like an office manager, right? And like yeah. that. Because because there are some jobs that nobody wants to do. All right, we, right? Should, we should definitely push yeah. this to another episode because I think it is really fascinating. It's really fascinating yeah. how to unite those two worlds and how to how to right. how to think creatively about being fair and everything. But um, was there a third thing I wanted to say? You go with your thing. The last one, thing I wanted to say, and this is another big topic, but I will just want to gesture to it at any rate, which is to go back to the alcohol thing. Also, 
something that changed for me when I became an editor in the field that I didn't realize was going to change was yeah. my dating patterns. Um, oh. Because up until that point, I had been just a writer. I'm Polly. I'm bi. Conventions were a little bit my happy hunting ground in my mid twenties, right? And so um, I had various flings and encounters, and it was terrific. And I didn't realize when I became an editor that I would suddenly feel like, oh, I am now in a professional relationship oh, right. potentially yeah. with all of these young writers, yeah. many of whom desperately want to be published in my magazine. The power mm -hmm. dynamic was mm -hmm. became very evident. And yeah. it wasn't necessarily a conscious decision, but I stopped dating in the field, basically. Mm -hmm. Like I like there were people I yeah. was already dating, but I stopped dating new people in the field, and yeah. uh, and I was in work mode at conventions, and that was, I don't know, I hadn't anticipated it, and I think it's, I thought it was a good move. It's interesting talking to, um, you know, I write with George R. R. Martin, and I I hang out with a lot of older writers in the field, and some of them are very wistful about the old days where mm. there was maybe quite a bit of sleeping around and yeah. quite a bit of alcohol flowing and uh in and like 60s 70s mm -hmm. uh loving culture um <laughs> and seeing that is all gone and i think uh i think it's interesting seeing talking about like where that intersects with a growing awareness of consent issues power yeah. dynamics the whole me too conversation i mean i and i sh i should i should say just just to footnote that it's like it's like um, there's, t it's often hard to disentangle the, the two effects, like the cohort effect and the year effect. I mean, maybe that's the right way to put it, but it's like, is it all gone or are we just 50? Like, <laughs> cause I'm not sure that if you, I mean, it's different and yes, I do think, well, I think it's, well, I think it's around, different like, and I think, you know, yeah, I mean, again, like yeah. I'm in a, the professional power dynamic stuff are still kind of at work cause I run the SLF yeah. and whatever, but if you're not in that situation, I think. So maybe I should separate this out. There's the the professional mm -hmm. question, and then there's the general convention culture, culture. question and dating yeah. within the convention yeah. and consent yeah. issues. But I think you know, and seeing how Wiscon and other cons have been navigating that, um, seeing what's happened with editors in the field and so on, um, is a maybe a, again a subject for another another I mean, con, I, I'm, another I think, session. Yeah, definitely worth another session. I mean, just to, I think that I guess what I'm saying is. Um, I think, yes, I think it's two things. I think that you made this responsible decision, which some people didn't make that responsible decision, but it was, that, that's wise and, yeah. and interesting. And I mean, an interesting cost, an interesting shift. Yeah. And also I think there, I definitely get the nostalgia and there's certainly is something to what they're saying. And I'm a little skeptical of the notion that you can't unite like happy playground and enthusiastic consent. Like, I think there's a well, bunch of skills yes. to be learned, but I'm sure, and I don't think we are the people right. to ask, but I'm sure that- No, no, no I would agree. <laughs> no, I, think, doing I, think, that work. I, I mean, I could, I could speak to that now, I think, um, sure. you know, but it, it has been a transition in the field, trying to figure out like, okay, here you have all of these writers who are writing stories with polymorphous yeah. sexuality in a variety of forms, and they come to the conventions. And uh, I think the youngsters- are much more aware of consent as an issue and have mm -hmm. learned how to are learning how to navigate yeah. it right? right and uh right. and i do think like being aware of the effect of alcohol helps mm -hmm. right yeah. so uh, being a little cautious on that front all yeah. right well we've all right we've we're out of time roamed all over and we're out of time so thanks ben see you soon sure. <laughs> okay. all right.